lot of people have asked this one. You describe your church as mystical or yourself as a mystic. Can you explain what you mean by that? Because we're all freaking out. <laughs> now, is this their question or is this your question? <laughs> uh, it was Sam asked me on the way here. <laughs> When I, when I, I read a book called The Barbarian Way years ago, and um, thank you, the one person who bought it. And, and in it, I, I talked about um, being a mystic. And one of my guys said, you can't use that phrase because that's going to put you in the heretic category. And I said, being mystical puts us in the heretic category? He goes, absolutely. So I put it all over the book. <laughs> and uh, because I thought, how can you read the Bible and read the stories of a man who sees a burning bush, another one who calls fire down from heaven, another one who hears, or one who hears the wind speak to him and tells him, ask him where he's at. How in the world can you possibly take the story of the scriptures of a guy named Abram who hears God tell him to go to places he's ever gone and not have an understanding that humanity is mystical? And I think a part of the problem is that we've lost our spirit. Like, we've lost our essence. The reason people are becoming Buddhists in the Western world is not because Buddha makes more sense than Jesus. It's because Buddhism is more open to spirituality than Christianity is. Wow. And so I would say, not only am I mystical, but if you're not, you need a life-changing experience with Jesus. And because God is supposed to be the oxygen of our life. His voice is our life. We're supposed to be able to hear God's voice. I became a follower of Christ. God's voice became intimate to me. And then I went to seminary, and they told me God did not speak that way anymore. And I said, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I want to I press back in. So I want it to be uncomfortable. Because if your life is explainable, it's not the life of God. And, and we're designed, and, and you can't really overstate this. Like, you're going to have voices speak into your head whether you think you're sane or not. And where did all those voices come from? How do all those voices get inside of you? It's because the voice of God is supposed to fill that space in your soul. And if it, God's voice isn't speaking to your soul, all those other voices are going to just become a muddled mess of voices telling you who you are and how you're to live your life. Yeah, and so there are times I feel like there's more of like this beautiful ebb and flow. You know, I wish I, I could say I could sustain it all the time, but I don't. Sometimes I'm just existing. Sometimes I'm just making it through the day. Some days I just go, I'm just going to do what's right and what I know to be true and Hold on. And then the other days, I'm like, it's as if I were, it's as if God was just like flowing in and out of my soul, and, and I could just feel where God is moving me, and I, I can't explain it. I want to live there, you know? And uh, I, I think that we're supposed to be more like surfers, you know, where we feel the pressure of the wave, and we're moving with it, and it's carrying us forward, and that's how I think our relationship with Jesus is supposed to be. In pastoring and leading a church, how do you negotiate the experiential subjective with, with the objective truth so that people don't end up surfing a wave all the way to an island that they should never visit? Okay, so give me an objective truth. Just, just pick one, and we'll go from there. If you've heard me preach it, no, I don't know any. Um, <laughs> uh, Jesus is the only way to God. Okay, Jesus is the only way to God. So let's translate this to subjective truth, okay? I had a woman come up to me and say, I love your talks, but you always end up talking about Jesus at the end. <laughs> she said, could you be like more broad? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I'm so sorry, Jesus is the only story I have. I, I'm, I'm so sorry that my story is inadequate for you. And I said, but if Buddha had changed my life, I would tell you that story. Right. And, um, or, you know, if Muhammad had changed my life or Krishna had changed my life. And so I, I looked at her and I said, I'm, so, I, 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 I'm only telling you 
the only, I'm telling you the only story I have. And, and I said, see, when Jesus says he's the only way, he's not being elitist. He's not saying that there's so many other ways, but you need to say no. What he's actually saying is that no one else is coming for you. Wow. <laughs> Someone's asked, what's the most important thing you learned on your journey from not a Christian to a Christian that stayed with you and influenced the way you do ministry? I, I don't know that journey. Like, that journey is too black and white for me. Okay. Of not a Christian to a Christian. Like, I, I, don't, I don't experience life like that. Your journey to faith? Yeah, I see. Because... Anybody ever buy a new car and you thought you had the only car in the town and then when you bought it, you saw that car everywhere? Because yeah. <laughs> I had a, like a, I'm a little like OCD, so I, like I bought my wife a Mini Cooper, then I bought my, my, my daughter a Mini Cooper, then I bought my son a Mini Cooper, and my wife's like, stop it, <laughs> you know? And I, and I go, but I, 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 I got to get a couple more. And, uh, and, and I, then I saw Mini Coopers everywhere. And then when I would done it with Jeeps, you know, like, like I bought a friend a Jeep, my son Jeep, me a Jeep, and, uh, and now I see Jeeps everywhere. Well, that's the way faith is. Like, if, if you step into faith with Jesus, and, the, and then you don't all of a sudden see Jesus all over in your past, right. you're not looking properly at it. <laughs> you know? So when a person says, this is when I met Jesus, this is after, this is when I came to faith, I'm going... You're not, like, when that rock hits, the splash goes in every direction. Huh. And I look back now and I go, oh, that's when God was talking to me when I was four. Oh, that was Jesus whispering to me when I was eight. Oh, wow, that was how God saved me when I was 11. And so, like, I don't look at my life as before and after. I look at, um, and that's why at Mosaic we always tell people, hey, even if you don't believe in God, we, we need you to know that God believes in you. Right. And, uh, like, this faith journey is only from your side starting now. It, that faith journey has been going on God's side the whole time. Right. You know? So the longer I live in Jesus, the blurrier it gets. It does become more black and white. I'm like, God, it was everywhere all the time. And how could I have missed it? And does it make sense? Yeah. You know? And so it becomes more beautiful because, like, before I came to Jesus, I was running across the highway and I didn't see a car, and he hit me head on and paralyzed me from the waist down. And, um, and then two ambulances came to drag me to a hospital. I had no feeling in my legs. Um, before I came to Jesus, I was working construction, and a ladder flipped four stories up, and I fell four stories straight down into concrete. It should have caused instantaneous death. But as I was dropping downward, I remembered the story. And the story prompted me to reach my left arm up, and I somehow grabbed the scaffold and swung in midair three stories up. That was before I met Jesus. And I look back and I realize God just kept saving my life. But I couldn't see it. And so what I would say is like, no, what happened after I came to faith is I got the eyes to see backwards. Wow. No. That, that perspective, which you've articulated so brilliantly, um, we all thought that. We just didn't know how to say that. <laughs> um, but this Sunday, we'll all be saying that. <laughs> people think, man, you're so mystical. Um, <laughs> it, it strikes you have a very... This will sound like such a dumb thing to say, but you have a very high view of, this is a really dumb thing to say, you have a really high view of non-Christians. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's, it's so dumb, right? You, you have a really high view of, see, we all say we love people, but we don't really love humanity or humans, if you know what I'm saying. I know exactly what you're saying. But, but yeah. you have this just love for, not just people per se, but for the human condition and the human soul. Does that come out of what you've just described, where God is everywhere, so whatever point a person is at right at this moment, you're not looking at that, you're looking at the whole, and that's what enables you to have such a heart for people? I don't know if I've explained that. Right. Yes. 
<laughs> I explained it brilliantly. Yeah, that was brilliant. I agree with you so much. In fact, I haven't heard anybody describe it quite like that. Have you heard of a psychologist called Henry Cloud? Yeah. Uh, Henry and I are friends, and he told me, he goes, you're like the perfect humanist because you're the humanist that knows the world needs Jesus. And you don't think we can solve the problems without Jesus. You just actually love humanity. And I thought, well, aren't we supposed to all love humanity? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, Jesus loves humanity, right? I mean, think about it. Jesus became human. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of humanist. <laughs> and, uh, we, we want to create this divide, right? You know, so you're right. I do have a really high value for humans and for people who don't believe in God. And I don't like them being diminished. I don't like people that Jesus being demeaned. I don't like us creating these, these generalizations about them. And uh, I, I hear Christians all the time say things like, well, you know, when you don't know, when you don't, when you don't believe in Jesus, um, in fact, someone actually said this. Well, you know, they're not a Christian, so they don't really know what love is. And, uh, you know, they don't know how to love. And I'm like, like, before I came to Jesus, I loved. Like, I, you know, I, it was imperfect. But after I come to Jesus, I love, and it's still imperfect. <laughs> you know? And so I think a lot of times we try to superimpose false truths on unbelievers. And I like honest people, whether they're Christians or not Christians. I like people who are trying to be authentic and transparent about where they are in life. And like, I don't have a problem with atheists. I have a problem with arrogant atheists. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with Christians. I have a problem with arrogant Christians. Right. I was at this one university and this uh, man came up to me and said, ah, if Christians were like the way you're describing them, I think I could be one. He said, but every Christian I've met is dogmatic and arrogant. And I said, no, no, you're getting confused. You've met dogmatic and arrogant people who happen to believe in God. Right. And you've superimposed that outcome on God. But I'm telling you, they were arrogant and dogmatic before they believed in God. Wow. Right. And, uh, and they looked at me and goes, that makes perfect sense. It's like it's so easy to go, no, don't blame God for, on, and don't blame us on God. <laughs> like, you know, we've got issues. And that's why we believe in Jesus, because we know we've got issues, and we're, we can't get out of those issues without him. Right. You know? But don't, like, just because God's willing to hang around with us, don't think less of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were talking earlier about, I asked you another stupid question. Um, because you're in Hollywood, do you have a high view or a dark view of Hollywood? And you, you told me about an interaction you'd had with someone where you actually... Um, not just defended Hollywood, but identified with Hollywood, which is your community. Can you repeat that? Story? Yeah, when he asked me if I had a high view or, I mean, optimistic or pessimistic view of Hollywood, I said, I have an optimistic view of life. And Hollywood is inside of that life. But I had a, a guy who ran for president come to my house, and I won't say who he is, um, conservative Republican. And, uh, and he started talking about they and us, and them and us, and them and us, and them and us. They're trying to do this, we need to do this. They're trying to do this, we need to do this. And finally, after like 45 minutes, I just looked at him and I said, hey, who are they and who are us? So, you know, they are Hollywood and we are us believers. And I, I said, I, I think you're confused. I know you're in my backyard, but I'm they. And whatever us you are, I'm not that us. So if you're going to war against them, you're going to war against me. Right. Because they're my people. Right. And I, I'm not, I don't have a Messiah complex. I'm not in Hollywood to save Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I hear so many Christians going, I'm coming to Hollywood to save Hollywood. I'm like, you know, you're 22 years old and you've never made a single work of art in your life, but you're going to save Hollywood. It's such a narcissistic view of ourselves. Why don't you come and serve Hollywood? and become so valuable to the lives of other people that they care about your life and what you have. I'm not there to save Hollywood. I'm there to serve Hollywood. And I love those people. And I love, you know, my wife, she would have a hard time going, so many narcissists here and so many people who are about their appearance and so many people who are all about fame. And I'm like, yeah, isn't it a, a, such a tragic thing that people are so desperately trying to find their identity in, in such surface areas. 
I, I was working on this uh, project and I met this billionaire in uh, Hollywood and uh, on, a, on a film thing and um, it was in a window where I wasn't really publicly as much a pastor and uh, he was only inviting me to come as a writer and director and I thought oh good I might be able to make like a good movie you know and um, and I was so nervous I even kind of like said to God God I'm not gonna like mention you <laughs> Like, so if you would just sort of wait outside for a few moments, you know, you know, I really want this project really bad. And, uh, and the guy, it was really cold. He goes, you got 45 minutes, I got a meeting. And then he looked at me, he goes, picked one of my things. He goes, tell me about this one. And it just happened to be about Solomon. I thought, dang it. You know, and I said, well, you know, that's when Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And he goes, well, what do you think? I said, I think he was wrong. I think there's always new things. He goes, and why is life so mundane? And I thought, such a great question. From a billionaire. Yeah. And 40 acres in Beverly Hills, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, if you're inside of the created order, there is nothing new under the sun. You're trapped. But when you're a part of the creative order, everything becomes new. He goes, huh. This can we talk more about that tomorrow? Suddenly he has all this time in the world. And so I go back the next day and he goes, okay, what's going on? He goes, I need to know, where did you, is you want to know why I invited you? I said, why? And he goes, you walked in, there's like peace everywhere. He goes, I'm looking for what's inside of you. He goes, how can I find that? And I thought, man, he's not going to make a movie with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, within three weeks, this guy gives his life to Jesus. And, and it, it's because these people are, they're, they're tapping into creativity, imagination, and beauty, artistry, innovation. Wow. And dang, anything for James? <laughs> and, uh, and it only makes the hollowness inside of the soul more extreme. Right. And like, I want to be there right. in that moment when that person says, I have everything and it's not enough. Like, those are the moments we live for. That's that old adage, isn't it? There's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and that's getting everything you want. And it not being what you need, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you deal with, um, in that environment, where people ask you direct questions regarding morality and lifestyle? Because obviously, Hollywood, you've got all sorts of lifestyles. So, so someone sits you down and just point blank says, all right, what's your view on this? And, I get more morality questions from Christians who want to justify their immorality than unbelievers. Yeah. I almost never get a morality question from an unbeliever because they're not questioning their morality. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a car one time and somewhere in the world that if I said where you'd know where I was and with who I was with. And I was with these four Christians and I got in the car and one of them said, hey, um, can we ask you a question? I said, sure. I said, is it a sin to smoke? And I said, does everything have to be a sin? Can some things just be stupid? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know that they all smoked. <laughs> and I heard that they all quit. <laughs> and, uh, see, I, I'm more like, hey, a lot of things are just stupid. You know? Like, I, I, don't, I, I try not to make things like super complex. You, you know? Like when someone talked to me about like, something in their life, I go, really, the Bible actually says everything is permissible. You know what, that's what it says, right? We don't like that. It just says not everything is beneficial. Yeah. So I like, so the more destructive you want your life to be, it's all permissible. Right. The more healthy and whole you want to be, it's not all beneficial. So I don't make my choices based on what's right and wrong. See, making your choices based on what's right and wrong is such low-level thinking. And, uh, and I never want any of my thinking to be low-level. I want my thinking to be what accentuates the highest level of being fully alive. So when a person talks about morality, I'm like, it all depends on what kind of life you want to live. Does it make sense to you, you know? And, um, and of course, we have the whole spectrum from homosexuality to... Um, you know, 
addictions to the environment. Like, you know, and Christians don't really think about the environment a whole lot. Because we're okay with destroying everything. You know, because after all, it's just something God created. <laughs> you, you know, so we can trash the planet since we have authority over it. And we don't think destroying the earth is a moral issue. But we think homosexuality is a moral issue. I mean, there is something strangely odd about us, right? You, you know, I find dishonesty to be more destructive than homosexuality. But Christians want to build a whole view on, on a person's sexuality rather than dealing with the fact that slander and gossip is more destructive to the human spirit. So I would, I kind of go back and go, hey, look, let's talk about the stuff that actually is affecting you and work our way through that. And, um, and we were, you know, and, and then we're pretty honest. Like, I, um, I don't think that um, a person's designed um, for, a, uh, for gay sexuality. But our church is full of people who are gay. And we, and we have such a beautiful, loving, healthy environment. But I, I, like, I have friends who are like, hugely influential in the gay community. And I'll say with them, hey, look, we disagree. That's why we have to walk together. So we got to teach people that you can disagree and still walk together. And, um, but when they go, yeah, but we need you to agree. And I go, my agreement or disagreement should be so irrelevant to you. Because if you're right, who cares if I'm wrong? If you're right, who cares if I agree? Right? Because I'm not that important of a human being. But what I'm not going to do is pretend I agree because just in case I'm right, you might need someone to talk to one day right. when you're trying to process it. And then so someone says, well, because um, not every, like, because I think you're asking about the gay issue in a very subtle way, you know, <laughs> and um, not every gay person's the same. Some people are gay and they say, I have no memory of being anything except for gay. And, and that's who they want to be. Other people are gay, and they remember being sexually abused, and it's not who they want to be. Other people are tormented because they don't have a sense of identity. Like, to treat everyone who's gay as if they're the same is so disrespectful to people. And so I just said, look, I'm never going to use, I'm never going to use a particular definition of a human and act as if every human is the same. It's like saying all Latinos are the same. Salvadorians are not the same as Mexicans, they're not the same as Puerto Ricans, they're not the same as Cubans, we're all different. And the moment you try to put us all in the same category, you've diminished who we are. It's like saying all white people are the same. I mean, you do look the same, but you know, but Scots are different than the Irish. And Brits are not Aussies, and if you ever think a Kiwi and Aussie are the same, you're out of your mind, <laughs> right? And so I, so whenever people say, what do you think about homosexuality, I go, that's such an inhumane question. Ask me what I think about my friend. And that's a different thing. See, I, I know people who are straight who are mean and unkind and arrogant. But as long as they're straight, we're OK with all their flaws. And, and I know people who are gay who are they're kind and generous and um, filled with like honor. And I'm like, really? You want me to reject that person because they're gay and accept this person because they're straight. You need to get your morality straight because people are not monolithic. They're complex. And I'd rather just deal with person, one person at a time and, um, and go forward that way. How do you then... I know that's not like what I'm supposed to say, but that's why we've got you here, because we, <laughs> we wanted to hear your view. Um, how do you then deal with volunteering and leadership in your church when you've got a lot of people who are processing all of this stuff? And how then do you delineate volunteers and leadership? We're really simple. If your agenda is anything except for Jesus, you don't get to lead here. If your agenda is Jesus, yeah, there's a room for you. And so when a, whether a person's, if their agenda is political or social, 
and it's not Jesus, they will never get to lead at Mosaic. But if your agenda is helping the world come to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, man, come and set the world on fire with us. Okay. What do your services look like? Um, you've, you said that you, um, you often directly address atheists in your service. So clearly you've got a lot of people coming to your services who have not yet made a commitment to follow Jesus. In fact, they don't even believe in God yet, but they're coming to your services. So I'm wondering, is there something about your services that is quite different to the way most of us do church? Or do you just do normal church, but you just have a different way of communicating? Yeah, I, I think it's um, the best way to explain it is if you come <laughs> and uh, is, uh, are you guys, do you guys like soccer? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I know you like rugby, but I, I, I can't think of a good rugby metaphor. And we can. So... I, I don't know if you're familiar, but like the United States is terrible at soccer, yeah. okay? And we're like a large country, and we can't even qualify for the World Cup. It's, it's astonishing. I mean, it, there should be a study on underachievement. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Brazil is great at soccer. Uh, France is rather small, and, um, and they're great at soccer. Um, the, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. I don't even know how they qualify as a nation. <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're like a thumbtack on the map, and, uh, but they're great at soccer. Now, how do you explain that? Now, when you ask what Mosaic is, I would say, if you go to Mosaic, you might just see soccer and go, oh, it's all the same thing. We're just doing church. But anyone who really understands soccer knows there's a difference between what the United States is doing on a soccer field and what Brazil is doing on a soccer field. It, it, it might take a minute, it, you know, because when you watch Brazilians play soccer, you go, oh, that's what soccer is. It's all about the spaces in between the players. And it's so nuanced that it's hard to explain because you have the same number of players, the same size field, the same posts. It's just church. We worship, we teach, people come, you do all the stuff. You have the same exact material for the game, but the game is different. Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let me ask it a different way. Rather than asking what's your church like, when you come to one of our churches, the Royal Owl, and you stand in someone else's church, what is it that you go, oh, I wish they wouldn't do that. Uh, two things, I almost never go to other people's churches. And that doesn't help me. <laughs> and, uh, and I try to never to be judgmental. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> this is a question someone asked. This is not my. Okay. <laughs> but I, I would say it has so much to do with the language. Okay. And um, like, I'm really concerned because part of the Christian world, I, I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know this, like we've created a culture of celebrity. And so we've taught young preachers to preach dynamic sermons that are completely irrelevant to the world and excite Christians so they can become famous. And, <laughs> but, so I'm nervous because our best preachers that are under 40 are almost completely irrelevant to an unbelieving world. Just straight up. And when I hear him preach, I go, you've learned every cliche in the world. Like years ago, I spoke at Planet Shakers in Melbourne, and as they were driving me there, I, I didn't get invited back so I can tell this story. <laughs> and, um, and as I was driving there, they said, when you speak truth, everyone's gonna respond. And I go, well, what do you mean? And they go, you know, when you speak truth, when you speak truth, I just, we just know we have a culture where everyone's going to respond and they just be really with you. And, and, uh, and I said, oh, so what you're saying is, when I say things that everyone already believes, everyone will really be responsive. They said, yes. <laughs> and I said, that doesn't work with me. I promise you, if I say anything meaningful, it'll probably be super quiet in the room. But my, my ego wants to preach to the crowd. And I had to fight my ego for decades going, I'm either going to be famous with Christians or infamous with them. 
and reach an unbelieving world. And so when I walk into Christianity, it's so obvious, it um, almost overwhelms me. The Christian culture is so distinct that an unbeliever feels out of place instantly. And even the language of our worship is incredibly inclusive. The language of our preaching is inclusive. So one of the biggest things, and I think I was just in Puerto Rico, and I asked one of my friends who's not a believer, an atheist, I said, hey, I want you to go check this church out for me. And they go, do I have to? And I said, yeah, because they want to be a mosaic, and I don't really know if they can. And so, so I sent an atheist to check a church out to see if they can become a mosaic. <laughs> see, who does that, right? And she goes, okay, okay, I'll go check it out. She, and then she says to me, but you know, it's all about the language, right? So this atheist knows that mosaic is all about the language. And it's not because I speak to atheists, it's because I talk to humans. Because you, you just strip away all the jargon, all the fake, and you just talk about things in real life, and then it applies to everyone. See, and then what concerns me is any sermon that actually does not help an unbeliever actually does not help a believer. And that's what I get really concerned about because I don't know if we, as the people of Jesus, are getting what we need put into us. Just unpack that statement a bit more for me. Any sermon that doesn't help an unbeliever doesn't help a believer. Yeah. Why? Because, like, how many times... Okay, your marriage is falling apart, but I'm going to teach you about the doctrine of the Trinity. Because if you can really understand the Trinity, your marriage will finally work. You know, your kids are, are, are struggling with anxiety and stress. They're 11 years old, and they're already having anxiety attacks. But I'm going to teach you, I'm going to talk to you about the second coming, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or speaking in tongues, and that's somehow going to fix your kids. So we keep teaching doctrines that actually do not in any way help a person live their life. Because we think that's what we're supposed to do. Because God's all about information. God's just a giant computer system, where if we get all the data right, we're finally spiritual. And we've spent, we, we sent people to Bible college and seminaries to study God. And they, they leave not knowing God. And, and I think that a huge part, so I look and go, how can, what do we need to talk about that helps everyone live their life? Because I think the Bible is the most brilliant anthropology and sociology book in the world. It tells me how to be human. And, and here's, when I became a Christian, I thought, I believe the Old Testament because Jesus does. Because I'm a follower of Jesus, so I'm, um, I'm Hebrew now. Yeah. But I was like, why do I believe the New Testament? I mean, why do you believe the New Testament? Like, what, what merits that? Right? Because the New Testament happened after Jesus. So I, I see, these are things that bother me. I struggle with that. And I go, and, I, I, and, and finally I thought, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the Gospels because the only place I can learn about Jesus is the gospel, so I'm hanging that one in there too. Yeah. And, and, then, and then I decided, okay, I'm gonna spend the next, I spend the next years of my life applying the, the truths in the Bible to people, because I said, I can't prove if this is true about God, but I can prove it's true about us. And if it's true about us, I can have confidence it's true about God. And I know for most people it doesn't make sense because Christians grew up going, I believe the Bible. But I came from outside going, why do I believe this? So the reason I have so much confidence in the scriptures, and I don't actually use the word Bible, I use scriptures because I think it's more sacred. And the reason I have so much confidence in the scriptures is because I know it works in real life. And so when I help a person, and I, my friends who don't believe in God, I'll ask them, why do you come to Mosaic? They go, because your view of the world makes more sense than mine. And so as I'm helping them understand who they are, it adds confidence that when I say who God is, it's true. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so we built it the other way around. See, Christians work from the authority of the Bible and say the Bible says, so this is true. Right. And then it doesn't actually have to relate to your life, you still accept it. With an unbeliever, you have to go, um, this is what the scriptures say about you as a human being. Does it resonate with you? It, does this ring true to your soul? Right. And what you'll have is you'll have people come back and go, how do you know this about me? 
how do you know me? And I go, I know you because God created you. And I'm reading the, I'm reading like the, um, the secret documents about your soul. And so I'm unlocking the human spirit on Sunday. And then it elevates belief and people come to Jesus. Which makes sense in a, a postmodern world because the only truth that most people believe in now is their truth. Their story is the story they believe. So it's the only truth we've ever believed in. Right. We just felt more comfortable back then because no one could argue with us. Right. Because really, James, all truth is subjective. Does that disturb you a little bit? Desperately. <laughs> and let me, can I give you a biblical basis for that? Yeah. Jesus said, I am the truth. He didn't say, I know the truth, or I have the truth. He said, I am the truth, which means it is connected to a subject. See, truth is subjective. It's just that you and me are not the subject. God is the subject. <laughs> truth exists because God can be trusted. And so I, when people say, well, you know, I have my truth, and I go, and uh, I said, that, that's so cute. <laughs> you know, because if you can have it, it doesn't have you, right? Right. And, uh, and so it's, it's too small of a truth. You're going to sink in the middle of all your ex life experience. Mm -hmm. Like, I look at the scripture, and I go, God is the source of all truth. And because God can be trusted, truth exists. If God could not be trusted, there would be no truth. Right. And so it is actually subjective. We're just not the subject. Right. And so I look and go, you can't actually have a truth apart from the object. That's why it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. But when you connect to God, you realize, oh, God is the source of all truth. Yeah. And because really, what's more important? That you know truth or that you are trustworthy? Because a lot of people say they know truth but then they're not trustworthy. And we're like, I don't think you know truth until you're trustworthy. See, I think the only truth you know is the truth you live. Everything else is just speculation. Yeah. Right? You, um, you said that a lot of your preaching, uh, forget the exact phrase you used, it was, it was good though. Um, you like to mess up people's reality or something to that effect. Oh no, I said, uh, it's amazing that my job is actually just to violate everyone's view of reality. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Much better than I thought. It's every, a strange job. Every Sunday you get up and violate people's view of reality. I do. I, that's, that's my goal. I don't always succeed. But if I have a commission, yeah, I want to I wanna, I wanna blow up people's view of reality. So what do you mean by that? Well, I just think we have so many like assumptions, you know. And um, because I... One, I think that once you see things clearly, you see Jesus. And, that, and once you see who Jesus is, you see his overwhelming beauty. So I'm like, I'm just trying to get people to see Jesus. Like, you know, loving God to me is like the most natural thing. Because once you know who God is, what option do, would you have but to love him, right? You know, it's loving each other that's a miracle. <laughs> that's what, like when we see each other for who we really are, then it's a little trickier, right? You know, and, but I think people come in with a lot of... Um, not only just preconceived beliefs, but sometimes you don't even know what belief is trapping you. Like you feel like you're suffocating in your life and you feel like something's missing, but you don't even realize it's like a prison you've created for yourself. And, uh, and so I'm not trying to violate people's worldviews to hurt them. I'm trying to set them free. They can realize there's more out there than there is. Yeah. You, you know, and, um, and, and you can see this almost like in everyday life. Um, because I remember one time I asked my mom, I said, Mom, why didn't you tell me there's so many options in the world? You know, and she said, before I came to Jesus, my, unit, my world was so small. She says, before I came to Jesus, I, I didn't know the world was big. And I think sometimes we forget, like, like you, you, ever, um, you ever notice that, like, doctors seem to have doctors for kids or, like, lawyers have lawyers for kids or... Actors have actors for kids, or yeah. presidents have presidents for kids. You know, it's like, right, you know, and at least in the states. And you know, you know why? It's not because they're smarter than you. It's because the kid grew up going, "Oh yeah, 
My dad's a doctor, my mom's a doctor. It's normal to be a doctor. See, the moment you see it, you actually assume you can become it. And there's so many things I couldn't see. So I thought I couldn't become. But the moment I saw it, I went, I can become this. So I want to destroy all the boundaries that limit people. And so they can become everything God wants them to become. You know? And, um, and then at the same time, I want Christians to be the people who are most clear about the truth. Like, I don't care. Like, oh, like scientific um, determinism, right? So um, there's like a national convention of, of scientists who are atheists. And they hold to what's called scientific determinism. They believe the universe is completely mathematical. And so they think that there's no such, uh, that, that choice is an illusion. That there's no creative act, there's no spirituality, because it's all mathematical, it's all cause and effect. Yeah. And I think this is fascinating because now if you're gonna be a scientific atheist, you have to believe that you have no free will. You have no choice, there's no creative act, there's no spirituality. See, I, 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 I love highlighting that. And because uh, now if you believe in God, you believe in a creative universe. See, so I'm going, okay, you can be an atheist if you want, but you have to accept that the universe is mathematical. Because that, that's the conclusion, and everything's determined, and that your future is already set, that you have no choice. Or you can believe that there's a God who imagined you, and you were imagined to imagine and created to create, and that you're, you're a spiritual being and you're free. And wh which, which view of reality do you like better? I, I, you know, see, and I, I think that, like, our faith can just keep elevating and elevating. Yes. So I want us the ones like pressing against and going, no, we're gonna fight for truth. I love what Dallas Willard said one time. Do you know, remember Dallas Willard? He was a, um, uh, a USC professor who wrote be beautiful books, The Divine Conspiracy. And he, I was in a meeting one time and he said, Jesus would pursue truth wherever it took him. And that was like so liberating to me. Right. He goes, Jesus would pursue truth wherever it took him. I thought, that's right. So I can pursue truth wherever it takes me. Like, I don't have to be afraid of biology or science or physics. I don't have to be afraid of anything. Right. Because Jesus would go wherever truth would lead him. And I think a lot of us as Christians are afraid to look at things truthfully. Right? right? Yeah. And, um, and the implications to me are extraordinary. And uh, because when you think about, like... Um, like Jesus, like walking on water or speaking to the wind or calling out the elements. Like we, we put those almost like in the, in the miracle category. See, and I actually put them into the what life was supposed to be like category. And so I don't actually even use the language almost of miracle because I think every miracle is a window into the life we lost. And so I like violating that reality because I'm going, no, there's so much more. We're so much more than we know. You know? But I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, think about yeah. this. We're using a microphone, and we're using sounds. Huh. You know, and, and those sounds are being translated by your brain into meaning. And when you say a sound, see, elephant is a sound. We call it a word, but it's three sounds. Elephant. Mm -hmm. And... And when I say that, it creates an image in your mind of an elephant. And there are like people where you go, there are people in Africa who use clicking languages. I don't know if I said anything profane. And, uh, <laughs> right? and we actually have the capacity to project meaning to one another. Yeah. Like that's like a superpower. Right. And we just take it as everyday humanity. So a huge part of like violating a person's view of reality is like to just keep pulling things back and going, no, everything is mystical. See, everything is spirit. We're just, we're blinded by the power and beauty of the material universe, but all that's energy, right? right? Yeah. I mean, this chair is just the same thing as my body moving at a different speed. So I started thinking, okay, like if all the universe is energy choosing different speeds at which to move, I go like, is it possible that God who is light is like God moving at light speed and, and Jesus is God slowing down to move at our speed so he materializes. Wow. 
And then the Holy Spirit is God moving in and out of time faster and slower. And when it's a miracle, it's God slowing down enough for us to materialize the energy of God in that moment. And uh, so anyway, I just, I'm going, there's just so many things to think about. So many things like to dream and imagine about. I think we haven't even begun to explore how awesome God is. Because I was thinking about that during breakfast this morning. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Are you the kind of preacher who asks more questions than you answer? That's because they have more questions than I have answers. Yes, of course. So are you. Is, is that one of the problems with preaching is that we, we get up and we just give a lot of answers without really, we're not inquisitive enough and curious enough? I think we give answers that we don't know. <laughs> and people without Jesus know we don't know. And so they just go, that's cute. And uh, I also think that people aren't interested in our answers as much as they're interested in our process. Like one of the things I try to tell my guys is when you're preaching, don't just come to the conclusion because you have to fight to that conclusion. Right. So take people into the process of what you struggle through to get there. You know, like I have convictions and it took me, it took me time to get there, to believe that. And so I want to take people into that process. That's, that's the more, I think, important part. And, and my kids are frustrated with me all the time. They go, dad, just tell me what to do. I mean, my son's 30, my daughter's 26. They still tell me that. Just give us an answer. And I go, well, the, the question is so important. And they go, no, we just need you to tell us an answer. And I'll tell them, I said, look, I have a conviction that when I tell you what to do, I make you weaker. And, and because if you do what I tell you and it succeeds, you've not gained confidence. You now have more confidence in me. And if I, and if I tell you what to do and it fails, you don't have to take responsibility because you can blame me. And so I, I think preaching should not abdicate, to, uh, allow people to abdicate their responsibility. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press you to make a choice, but you have to choose. I'm going to give you the best understanding I have of a conviction, but you have to decide whether it's your conviction. And, and I feel it's the same way with answers and with um, responsibility. I don't tell people what to do. I don't tell people what to believe. And people would say, well, you know, are you trying to convert, you know, are you going to try to convert me? I go, in fact, I had a friend tell me, you know, like he thought I was going to try to convert him. I said, man, you're like so arrogant. Why would I try to convert you? Like, one, you're not the center of my universe. I don't need you to be converted for my world to be better. <laughs> you know? And, uh, um, and if you're like doing awesome, why would I want to ruin that? You know? So you must be doing awesome. Well, no, I'm not doing well. And I go, oh, well, do you want help? <laughs> See, I, I don't need to convert anyone, but I do want to help everyone who wants to, f wants to find a new life and a new future and a new why. So, like, I feel, no res I, I feel no weight of a need to convert anyone. I don't even need to win an argument. Like, sometimes I just love it. I go, okay, let's not even argue. Let's just wait and see if somehow you'll know that God is here. Right. It's like, I, I really love throwing things out where if God doesn't show up, I'm a fool. Because that's when it's exciting, right? You know, when you're like, all right, let's just see. Let's just see. It's kind of cool. Yeah. What are the things in our culture at the moment that you really like and you think are great opportunities for the church? I love a lot of things. One, um, I love how... Um, the church is becoming a revolution of human creativity. I really believe there's going to be a shift in history. And the church has been known more for tradition, for safety, for security, uh, for orthodoxy. I think the future church is going to be known for imagination, creativity, beauty, artistry, vision. And I, I love that. Why do you think that? Do you think that because that's what you dream about? Or are you seeing that happening right now? I, I believe that because I was fighting for it 40 years ago, and um, I didn't have anyone really was standing with me. And I've watched over 40 years the church shift, and now the language of creativity is normal in the church. Mm -hmm. Like there are things I said 20 years ago that made me a heretic that now churches say and they think it's orthodoxy. And so I'm like excited 
because the church is slow, but we're not dead. <laughs> you know? That's true. Yeah. And sometimes it takes us a while to get it. Yeah. But you just have to keep like pounding it in. I think this next generation, they're, they know that spirituality is the natural result of creativity and that creativity is the natural result of spirituality. You cannot be creative without being spiritual. And you cannot be spiritual without being creative. We're interlocked in this. And I think there's a generation that knows that the church is supposed to be the epicenter of human creativity. And it's going to be a sweeping trend across the world. I believe that. Uh, I actually believe before I die that the church will be redefined as a creative epicenter of the world. And um, so that's why I'm still traveling the world. And that's why I'm doing this. Um, Paint the picture a bit more for me. What does that, what does that look like? The church is the See, creative. it's not about art. Because when we were doing it 30 years ago, dancers, painters, filmmakers, and everybody thought, oh, it's all about artists. No, that was just a metaphor. <laughs> See, teachers need to be creative, and doctors need to be creative, and parents need to be creative. And see, we need a, a, a shift of anthropology that every human being is creative. Uh, quick, like, little survey. How many of you would say that um, you're a creative genius? All right, this denomination is in real trouble. <laughs> all right. All right, let me try again. Okay, and how many would say you're linguistic savants? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, how many would say that you're humans? Okay, I, I just want you to, all right. No, here's the thing. See, uh, you don't think you're a linguistic savant, but you learned English when you were two. Right. Because you were a linguistic savant. You were a genius. And if they'd moved you to Japan, you would learn Japanese. If they'd moved you to Germany, you'd learn German. You were born a linguistic savant. You just don't know you are because your brain was told you only needed one language, English. So you limited your capacity, but it doesn't mean that was your capacity. In the same way, when you were born, you were a creative genius, but you were told that you were just to be a good student. And so you didn't need that creativity because the church didn't need that creativity. The church needed your obedience. The church needs your standardization. The church needs your compliance. Discipleship is about doing what you're told. But the moment the church shifts and says, no, discipleship isn't about standardization. Discipleship is about uniqueness. Discipleship is not about conforming. Discipleship is about unlocking your God-given creativity. Everything's going to shift. So I'm on a mission to convince every human being that they're an artist and that they're, that they're a creative and that this is the way you're designed by God. And so I actually think the church has made the shift and it's making it faster than other organizations across the world. And, uh, and that for me is pretty exciting. Like, I feel it, I see it everywhere. And at first it's imitation, it's okay. Because you know, at first we imitate, right? I mean, when they used to go to the, uh, to the Louvre, all the artists would, would imitate the artists of the great, um, of the great painters but Monet would look out the window and paint what he saw outside. And he would turn his back to the great artist of the past and begin to paint what he imagined and saw you know, through the window. And so there's a time where you're supposed to imitate the artist of the past, but then there's a time you gotta just turn your back on it, look out the window, begin painting what you see. And I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Very good. We'd like to fly you back sometime to continue the conversation because we could keep going. Um, thank you so much for your time this morning. Obviously different to the last couple of days, but we've just so enjoyed your relaxed manner, your willingness just <laughs> to talk about everything and anything and just how inspiring uh, you are. We've really appreciated your time and appreciate the opportunity to get to know you better too. I, I think we all agree, we really like you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We like you a lot. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's been an honor. And um, thank you guys so much. It's been a joy to be with you, James. You are brilliant. And, uh, and I'm going to give a plug to my daughter's band, MSC. They have a new album called Heaven. And my favorite line in the, in the album is, Heaven is where you are, speaking to Jesus. And, um, and so I just want to encourage you guys to go out and grab that. Give it a good plug. The album is called Heaven? Yeah. On iTunes, or how do we get hold of it? Uh, <laughs> iTunes, Spotify, Spotify, and what's that? YouTube. And the music videos are free, right? Yeah, there's a uh, couple of uh, music videos, um, one called 15. It's on the Prodigal Son. 
It's actually really I heard brilliant. that last night. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, so I just want to tell you that so I can tell my daughter when, when I went home that I, uh, I plugged her band. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> hey, God bless you guys. Love Very you. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm.